Hi, everyone. My name is Grace, and I'm the events producer at University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington. I'd like to welcome you all to our event with Anna Gomez and Christopher Polaha in celebration of the publication date of Moments Like These. Thank you all for supporting a local independent bookstore. University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in the region. In fact, we're celebrating our 121st anniversary this year. A few words about our authors tonight before I turn it over to them. Anna Gomez writes about real life, real flawed characters and the saving grace of unconditional love. She has published six novels, all of which have ranked as bestsellers in their respective categories and three of which have won literary awards. Her experience of living and growing up in a foreign country plays a large part in her stories. Her stories are realistic and honest, thought provoking and impactful. Anna is also Chief Financial Officer for Leo Burnett Worldwide, a global advertising company. In that capacity, she serves on the board of several nonprofit organizations and is also the executive sponsor for a number of employee resource groups focused on diversity and inclusion. In 2020, she was featured in several publications and was named one of the top 100 female executives by Yahoo Finance. Christopher Palaha is best known for his long starring role in the critically acclaimed series, Life Unexpected. He has appeared in Hallmark Channel movies such as Dater's Handbook with Meghan Markle and the Mystery 101 franchise. He first received attention for his portrayal of John F. Kennedy Jr. in the TV movie, America's Prince, opposite Portia de Rossi. He's appeared in numerous films, including most recently, Wonder Woman 1984 and Jurassic World Dominion. In addition to his work as an actor, producer, and director, Christopher is branching into the book world by co-authoring this new series. He's an ambassador for World Vision and on the boards of Her Arts in Action and the Palaha Family Circus Foundation. We're gonna start this event with a discussion between Anna and Christopher, followed by some audience Q&A. If you have any questions for them at any time, please type it into the Q&A field at any time during the event, and we'll ask them at the end. Um, if you are having a little bit of trouble figuring out the Q&A field, feel free to just put that into the chat, and we'll also be monitoring that. And now I'm going to turn it over to Anna and Christopher. Thank you, Grace. That was a beautiful introduction. Appreciate it. And, and we're so happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Nice to see yeah. you guys. Well, we can't really see you, but nice to have you here. It's nice to be uh, presented in front of you. Display yeah. like Yes. Like. So I'm Anna Gomez. I'm Christopher Blaha, and we wrote a book. Yes, a really great book, I think. Yes, yeah. Um, well, hi, how, how, hi. Was your, how was your book launch birthing day? Well, I worked, but I kept up with everything. I think we're doing really well. How was your release date? It's your very first book, Chris. It is. It's the International Gomez Palaha Book Launch Day, March 9th, 2021. Never in my wildest dreams, if you said to me like 10 years ago, hey, Chris, do you think in 10 years you'll have a book like release day? I would have been like, no. Um, but you made that a reality for me less than a year ago, in fact. Yeah. Which is kind of remarkable, and if when I when I stop and think about it, that a year, literally a year ago, this wasn't even on my radar. And then in May we met, and away she went. And then we made a book. That's right, we wrote a book. So let's tell everyone our funny story. Okay. <laughs> story of um, serendipity and coincidence and whatnot. So they call that in a Hallmark movie. What? Meat cute. Meat <laughs> cute. Yeah. Tell them about our meat cute. Our meat cute. So we uh, we were strangers. You were a CFO and a women's lit author, living your own life and living well. Like you've been crushing it. And I've been doing my thing. Actor, TV, doing my stuff, grinding it out. Movies in one year. Yeah. Still big movies in one year. So you were crushing it too first and um and i had just opened up my production company called podunk productions where i've been trying to sell ideas and stories and create pitches for different networks hallmark among them but also cbs and fox and i just go in and i'll pitch um and every time i go in and i pitch what i've been doing is taking my own ideas in 
and I'm not a showrunner and I've never done it before. And so literally the presidents of networks would sit down with me and be like, this is a great idea, Chris, but you need to have IP. You need to have a showrunner attached. I want to see a script attached. I need a whole thing. So come back when you have that. So that was kind of what I was fishing for. And we have a friend in common, a man named Javier and his wife, Ann. And uh, one day during the pandemic, during lockdown, the very front end of the quarantine, uh, I was outside, socially distanced from the rest of my neighborhood, playing football with my sons. Javier walks up, says, I know a woman named Anna. She has six novels that are ready to go to film, be turned into movies. And I think it would be an amazing thing for you two to have a conversation because maybe there's some overlap. And I think he sent you my information, enough for me to get an email from you and Rose Wind. Yeah. To- understand what Rosewind was doing because that's also something that we've never really talked about right Rosewind was a brand new imprint to yep. the media yeah Rosewind's intention was to create sort of hallmark audience friendly literature and so all of a sudden there was enough common interest for us to warrant a zoom meeting not unlike this except we didn't have people watching it. and and we were wearing the same shirt we were wearing the same shirt so we get on zoom and you point to me and go like this, and I point back yeah, to you. We're both, we're both like the same striped shirt. <laughs> and that was weird, but it was also really funny. Um, so let me continue the story. So Javier texts me and says, Hey, I saw Chris um, while walking the dog or while he was outside, and I mentioned you, and he's really interested. And I was like, okay, um, yeah, so let's, you guys need to set up a call or something like that and, and just talk, you know, talk through what you you, you would ask me um, to help you with. And so I, I was like, okay, yeah, okay. And then, so I get, we get the email from Javier introducing us and you send a response like right away and say, hey, yeah, I'm interested in speaking to you. Can we set up a call? Right, right. And we did. And we had the meet cute Zoom call with the matching shirts. Exactly. And basically what we talked about was you had written six books that were way too mature, way too emotionally, um, just, I don't want to say intense, but deeper than like what the Hallmark Matrix would want. And I said so much and I said, listen, and then I was also, I kind of told you how, you know, things get broken down as far as, you know, how the business goes. Um, and then I said, but if you ever wanted to maybe collaborate on something, like if you ever had an idea and you and I wanted to write it together, thinking months down the road, thinking a one-off book, thinking a simple romance between a guy and a girl at Christmas time, I don't know. Yeah. And, and I was like, you know, then we could take that in. We would own the IP. I think it would be also a fun experience. Honestly, I was thinking, you know what? We'd create the story from the ground up. We'd write a book together. We'd have full control of the story. Then when we adapt that to a screenplay, we would have absolute control from page to screen and it would be a lot of fun along the way. And what did you say to me in that first Zoom call? Well, as a matter of fact, I am writing. (laughs) First I said, I'm writing a book that's set in Hawaii. And then I said, well, actually it's a series of books set in Hawaii. And what did you say? Well, you first invited me to co-author those in, time, in, yeah. all, in its entire oh gosh, That's such a coincidence. I know Hawaii. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe you'd, li- you'd like to collaborate with me. And I said, yes. <laughs> and I said, but hold on. Yes, but sure. Let's think about it. No, you said yes. And I'm like, great. And you're like, well, hold on. And I said, wait, slow your roll. Don't you got to talk to your husband? Don't you got to talk to your agent? Like, aren't there things that have to be discussed with other people first? And you're like, I think I'm pretty good. And <laughs> I mean, literally, like, and you're like, what do you think? And I was like, no, I, I'm, are you kidding? And I was like, well, what are the details? Like, what, are, like, what does this mean? I didn't understand the logistics of it, but yeah, we both thought about it for two days. We had Friday, Saturday and Sunday to think about it. Got back on a Zoom call Monday and we sealed the deal. Yeah. Signed a collaboration agreement. On Wednesday. Yeah. And uh, yeah, two and days later. Again. And we started working out. And it's funny because the way we write is a lot, is very similar to how we just told the story. Like you tell a little bit, I'll pick up and tell a little bit. We kind of bounce each other. Like we kind of bounce off each other idea wise. And 
and it's really been a joy. I mean, it's been this fun. We we had just had a chance to give talk at. Um, I don't think, I don't think it would have gotten that quick a start. You would have been busy doing something if it wasn't COVID. That's and that's always what I tell my family. Like I think, the unfortunate situation of COVID was a factor in the fact that you were home. You were leaving though to film something, but you were home at that time. Yeah. No, it was a huge, it, was, it played a huge factor because I mean, even from just being outside every day with my kids, we made a point of going out. I had to get my kids outside and get them exercise. I have three boys. And one of them at the time was nine and the other one was 13 and the other one was 15 and they needed exercise. And so we were out every single day and Javier and his wife would walk every single day. And so we had created this routine of like, hey, and I had literally just said to him, I'm starting a production company. I, I have a script for uh, long. Day. So I trans, I don't think you know this. I transcribed Long Day's Journey into Night, the play by Eugene O'Neill into a screenplay. It's like a 175 page screenplay that I have. That like, like no, I did this years ago, I did this like three years okay. ago, but when I saw Javier um, and I realized what he does for a living, which is like sort of galvanize money and, and raise money for different foundations and stuff. And I said, dude, if you ever want to like help me raise money for projects, I said, I've got a really great project. I just don't have any financial backing for it. And I said, but it's Oscar bait. And it would attract like the cream of the crop as far as acting goes, because it's long day's journey into night. And I've read that play every single year of my life since I was 18 years old. So I think weirdly without being, without expressing too much hubris, like I might be an expert on that play in a way that most people aren't in the world because I've literally read it every year and studied it. And I looked at it from Edmund's role to Jamie's role to James role. So I had this whole thing. And I was like, if you ever want to like find money for that. So I'd already put the bug into his ear, which was only because we were always outside and we just happened to see each other. And there was a familiarity that started so that when he brought you up, it was really par for the course. So that was two months in the making just between Javier and I. So the groundwork was already laid. And so then when you showed up, yeah. And then the fact that I just had a wide open schedule and also you, you mentioned the job, I had the comfort of knowing I was about to make a living. And I think that was a big difference too, because having the security of a job gave me the freedom to feel that creative energy versus like white knuckling my way through life, which, you know, our story for COVID is very different than I think a lot of other people's. Yeah. So, you know, survivor guilt, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Um, it, you know, in fact, when I, uh, when we, we signed the agreement and we were going to make an announcement that we were going to write a book, I felt guilty about it. I felt guilty about saying, saying stuff, you know, because it was a hard time for everybody else. Yeah. So, but we were able to. Having moments in during 2020, like having positive moments. I think there were a lot of people who were very quiet about successes or victories or good things. Yes. Yes. But I would say that the pandemic informed this book. I mean, we wrote a book about an escape to Hawaii where a woman who has been, um, who's literally worked herself. Sick. Sick. I mean, she yeah. passes out at a, at, a, at a function and we start with her in the hospital um, and she has to get away. And so we created this, like a book for people to kind of escape like they get to go on a ride with Andy, which I think was, I mean, I know that was always the intention and it would have, it was, you know, you had said that you created a series that was going to take place in Hawaii. And, but it's, it's interesting the way that it, it manifested while we were all stuck at home and while we oh, were. Yeah. And, and I think it, it took a really different turn. I mean, all I know is that she got burnt out. She had to go to Hawaii. That was it. And it's funny. Cause it was um, when, when, I, when, my agent said, try to write something for Hallmark. I was trying to find a storyline that was going to be different because I knew it had to be the matrix. It had to be set, but I was trying to find a situation that, that was different. And you know, what was Hawaii known for and what was the history of Hawaii? And that's where the plantation idea came. I didn't, I wanted it to be different 
Yeah. Um, I wanted it to be against the backdrop of something. And so by the time we met, I was like, okay, it's this plantation. But then you and I really, when you when when you started writing with me, I mean, we it just flowed through. I mean, it wasn't something that we had planned. Like the storyline was taking turns and turns. I remember we hadn't built up Warren yet. Right. You know, Warren was just a guy she met. We didn't right. know. We, he he didn't have the substance. Like he didn't have, he wasn't a person, a character yet. He was actually kind of shady. Like I remember that when the first chapter, there yeah. was, he was shady and she was not trusting. And it was a very kind of like, I remember reading that being like, well, I think we need to set it up. Like, it was interesting because when you set a series, one of my initial questions was, well, does this mean that we have to set the whole thing on the plantation for the five books? Like, are we limited to Andy and Warren? Are we limited to the plantation? Like, what is the parameter for the fact that we're creating a series. And so that was something that was really cool because we both had started spitballing ideas. And then we just got on this idea of like, well, what if we create a universe? And what if what if the books just follow who, who they want to follow? And, and we, yeah. almost to the point where we have like this idea of book four being loosely open to the readers to, to say, well, why don't you make it about so-and-so? And we know yeah. what it is, we know what three is, we know what two is, is we're happy yeah. with two. Um, and I think what we're finding and the readers that are on this audience right now, as you're reading the book, you're, you're going to find that you're going to invest in a couple of the characters or all the characters. And I think what we're finding is that everybody wants to know what happens to Andy and Warren, but everybody will also want to know what happens to everybody else. So it's, it's just the perfect setup. It is. If I may say so myself. It is a good thing. <laughs> you know, I just saw there was someone that said, the Kona MCU, and um, I was thinking from Kona with love would be the FK, <laughs> like our 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 initials for that. We'd have to FKWLU would have to be the full, you know. Um, but we have the universe that we're creating, and um, it really is a fecund universe. Like there's so many stories, there's so many places that we can tell, walk through. And I particularly enjoyed writing this with you because we didn't have an agenda and we didn't necessarily have, did we have a release date? It was supposed to be November. Yeah, we, we didn't really, when we, were, when we started writing together, it was up in the air. You and I are very driven in that sense. We're competitive and driven, not with each other, but around with everything around us. So we wanted a date. Right. We don't like it when someone writes four chapters. Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that's what we always were setting a date. It was supposed to be November, what we were talked out of it. And I'm glad, I'm glad we waited because I think, I think we were able to grow that book yeah. a lot. Um, today became a special day, like March 9th is right. Like today is right. Yeah, it feels right. It feels right, March It 9th. feels right to hit number one bestseller. Already? Yes. <laughs> no. Um, working with you has also been a pleasure because you and I function, it's weird. We are very similar. You would pitch, you would write a chapter and I knew like we would, we would basically like, so, okay. So for example, we're telling the story about how we met and I'll be like, and then you tell about the phone call and I'll know something that I'll have a piece of information that I'll be wanting you to share. And I'll be like, oh, I hope she says, and then you'll say the thing that I want. I was like, gosh, she did it, she got it. So when we have this thing that happens between us, like the ball was passed and thrown and caught and thrown perfectly so many times. So that's where we're similar. And then where we're different is like, I'm like the whirling dervish that was in the UK up until God knows when, three days in a row and I'm going like, what day is the Zoom? What day is it? And you're so like, okay, this is when we're on our Zoom. You've got your lists. It's all planned out. So your order and your structure and my sort of chaos met and merged pretty seamlessly. And I think you've actually helped me, you know, function a lot better. Well, no, I, and I, I think it, I think if we both were the same, we would clash. Could you imagine if you were always on schedule? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know, and remember, like right after the UK, you had to go to Vancouver, and then you were leaving Vancouver, and then you got another thing. So then you had to stay in Vancouver. Yeah. 
So I'm here like keeping track. I'd be like your your mom, like, okay, so so like when are you going home? And then you'd text me, go, okay, I, I we're staying two more weeks. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I know your well, sister almost you offered your sister's help to help us find a place. Uh, over in Vancouver. I mean, it's really been a wonderful collaboration and it's been a friendship. Like it, it went from, you know, two total strangers who yeah. had a had a common thought, interest, idea. And you have really brought me, I mean, it's it's kind of miraculous. You've brought me into a world that I probably, I mean, now I think officially I have some business in, but up until last May I had no business in. And you've, you've made some, you've opened up doors for me um, just in this, in this world of like, you know, meeting Italia and the editor that you already had in place and Juan who did our, who are, who are, did our cover artist. Um, just all the stuff that you already had at your disposal because you'd written six books. And here I was this guy who's like, well, I'll, I'll hitch my wagon up to your, uh, up to your wagon train there. And, and you were very gracious. You were like, okay, come along and you brought me into this world and you've been just generous and you've been patient with me and just constantly encouraging. And so what I said about the, the acknowledgements, you and the acknowledgements, it's all true. I mean, it's really been one of those once in a lifetime collaborations and I'm just so grateful for you, Hannah, so. And you too, I am too. You always say that. And it's just like, I've been through the same thing. It, it was a journey for me to share my words you saved me writing this book with you saved me during covid um i wasn't used to being home i traveled every week and all of a sudden my world came to a stop and i didn't know how to handle being home i didn't know how to handle being around the family i didn't like i i was so displaced and writing the book with you gave me not only a friend because i would tell you like okay like i'm going crazy like you know like I would have someone to talk to, number one. Number two is, it was just such a creative endeavor. Like it was so creative. Like it was such a connection creatively. Yeah. Um, that it would be like, I mean, I remember when we were writing the book, first the time zones. So we would have to do it after your run, <laughs> after your run or really late at night. So you would do 10 p.m., 10 p.m. London time. And it would be like, 3 p.m. here so like I'd block my meeting calendar so that nobody sets up a meeting in the afternoon with me and then you were like after dinner or in the morning right after you run yeah and, and yeah. like you would get on a call and everything right. and it was like there was like this cadence where if we didn't talk then the ideas <laughs> would get stuck right it would stop the flow and there was something about every week we were really we were really religious about every week showing up to the Zoom meetings, having our creative meetings, spitballing, pitching ideas to one another. Yep. I mean, out. The very detail. Yeah. The very detail of like, where do you think they went to school? What do you, you know, what, you know, what hat did he wear? Or does he have a brother? Or, you know, all that stuff. Like those ideas were just going back and forth at a time when, you know, you had stuff going on, I had stuff going on, but we were focused on getting the story done. And I remember towards the end, when we finished the book, you already done, you were winding down on, on shooting Jurassic and you were, your family was there and you stayed a couple more weeks. And I said to you, give me two weeks. Let me just like firm up like the last chapters and send them to you. And so I did that and I sent them to you and then you finished it. So like, it was like this thing where either we write a lot, we don't write a lot, but at the end of the day, like, you know, and the effort was truly, truly 50, 50. Yeah. It was also, it was also funny because it was a Herculean amount of work. I mean, there was, if there's anyone who's writing a book and, and like, you know what it's like to go off into a dark room and write by yourself. And so the joy of co-authoring and having a collaboration is that we were able to get on Zoom and have the friendly, you know, banter about like Andy and Warren and also the immediate gratification of, I would send you a chapter. I would literally wait. You would be like, I'm going to read it. And then I would wait the 20 minutes or the five seconds sometimes. Yeah. One time I, did it, I was like, whoa, you're fast. <laughs> Cause you'd like, I love there, was, it. there was at one point there was a rhythm there that was happening so fast where there was truly, I mean, I, cause I think the, 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 the viewer has to keep in mind that 15 days I was in quarantine 
it was almost around the clock, the book occupied. So there was like a fever pitch. It's like a fever dream. It just was like, I mean, stuff was pouring out of me. You were responding just as quickly. So for you, it was really impressive because you didn't get your life put on hold. I did, and I was able to do something, but you kept up. So that was what was cool about it. And we really did, we jammed out like, I mean, you had the record. It was, what was it, like 50,000 words in 15 days or something like that? Like we did like yeah, something. Yeah, like 46 or something. I mean, and then we went over and I'm like, okay, Chris, just focus on 60. And then I'm like, we're at 70. Like yeah. it just kept going, <laughs> you okay. know? Um, I, love the, I love the story about when the book was done you gave it to me to read and you said, okay, take a, take a pass, look at your thing. And I kept coming back with all this, <laughs> like Jay, I kept coming. I was like, okay, so um, I added a thing in chapter uh, 22. I hope you're fine with it. And you're like, and then you'd read it and you're like, fine, it's fine. Like it's good. And, and so there was this funny thing. And at a certain point you're like, okay, we got to At some point we got to stop. We got to just give it to the editor. We got to move on because you got to, which was, which was an interesting moment to be like uh, creating something and then just make the decision like, it's good, it's ready, let's, it, whatever, let's send well, it off. Speaking of the editor, for a first time writer, we hardly had any edits and you know that. I mean, they were easy edits yeah. and they weren't even edits. They were like, do you really need Lily? You know, they were like, they weren't mm -hmm. even like, hey, you wrote this wrong or this doesn't make sense or nothing like that, you know? Which is also a part of the surreal. I mean, honestly, I was expecting you to get my first chapter and be like, you suck. Like, <laughs> I can't do this. Why don't you just put your name on it? I'll write the book and then we'll just, we'll split it 90, 10. <laughs> and I'm like, uh. but you genuinely were like, no, this is good stuff. Keep them coming. Yeah. I mean, that's again, a part of your encouragement and a part of why it's been such a treat because it was like discovering a, a new superpower. I mean, golly, it's, I don't know. It's very surreal. And the fact that we're sitting here on lists right now, number one, this, that, the other, I mean, it's really- In one day. This is, I've never been number one on release day. It took me a few days. Hey, oh, what side am I on? What side am I on your screen? Am I on your left or your right? Yeah, my left. This is my left shoulder. Which one's your left shoulder? Yes. Here, give me a high five. Here we go. <laughs> Super. Um, it's 6.30. Do you want to, do you want to keep talking? We could talk all night, but do you want to look at, um, questions? We do have a lot, um, we do have a lot of questions. So why don't we do five more minutes? Okay. So yeah, that's exactly why I hopped back on just to say that we do have about eight questions now and people can keep them coming along. So if you do want to do five more minutes then I'll hop back on and ask those questions. Yeah, awesome. we're just going to wrap see up. See you guys right? soon. <laughs> yeah, we'll wrap up and just tell everyone how much we enjoyed writing this and how, how every single one of the people in your group and in my group have inspired us so much to write this book. Um, at a time where people couldn't travel, we tried to take them to a place they've never been before. Um, and, you know, we hope we hope that people love it as much as we do and love our characters as much as we do. Yeah. Yes. hundred <laughs> percent. I also loved, um, we were just talking with an old friend of mine, Nikki Deloche, about... Who was fantastic, by the way. It was fun. And... Um, and she was saying how it was interesting because I love that she read your your chapter. I love that she that that thing that you wrote about seeing colors and about her because she responded really well to Andy's desire for stillness. And, you know, Warren, who was a broken dude and had broken relationships and didn't know how to love and didn't know how to, you know, all, all of these things that change in Warren and all of these things that change in Andy. So I think we wanted to create a romp. We wanted to create something that would, that would not be titillating in the in the in the wrong way, but exciting. Like if you love a Hallmark movie, the idea of a, of a guy and a girl coming together and falling in love. We wanted that to be in this book, but I think you and I also strove for something deeper and richer, in the sense that we were really striving for some like a connection of the soul, and what real love looks like, when how real love can change a life. And yeah. not, not like quick love or lusty love or these things that like, 
like we go deep and we go, we go, we invested in these two people. Um, and that was an amazing exercise. And, you know, I started something called the Palaha Chautauqua. And I think that, and the whole conversation regarding what I've been talking about publicly is how do we go through life loving each other in that way that is almost like experiencing heaven on earth. Like, how do you bring heaven to earth? And I think in a weird way, like you and I and our friendship and the conversations that we were having informed the Chautauqua and the Chautauqua informed what was going on with these two. And there is something rich about, and, and so all of a sudden you get this little taste of heaven between these two people and they experience these moments. And those moments, you know, will help, well, you know, you, it'll, it'll last a lifetime for them. And it's really a fun, I don't know. I think we created, it's something I'm very proud of. To, to basically, I'm just reiterating what you just said in my long winded way. <laughs> you know what I wanted to let the readers know too, that's the, is that every part, the, you wrote those. Those were the haikus that you wrote for every part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My haikus are in the book. Haikus are in the book. So we wanted to make sure that we immortalized those really good haikus. So we put three, I think three parts. So the haikus were there. Right. And that's, you know, and Nikki, Nikki um, quoted one of them because she loved them about the prison and the, you know. So that's, that. I mean, that's great. I mean, I loved, I loved those parts, so. There's so many, good. we should do one of these one day where we just read um, like, th we, we each have like three favorite parts and we just read favorite parts. We have a lot going on, dude. We're going to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the audio. All right, you want to answer some questions? Yeah, we're going to call Grace back in so we can answer questions. Hi, Grace. Hello, that was really wonderful, both of you. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I was watching the chat and People are just, you know, really happy to find out more about you, more about the book. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we have some questions and we can still keep them coming on. We'll get to as many as we can. The first question is, are the characters based on anyone you know? Anna? It's based, you know, the one advice I give people who write, um, even when I, like, you know, hold creative classes or whatnot, is just you write what you know. So the characters are based on us, on people we know, on people we've lived with and dealt with. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a bit of Warren in me. I mean, um, there's a bit of me in Warren. You know what I mean? He's not a he's not a far stretch. And then, uh, but you, yeah, the definitely like in the book we're writing right now, there's a character that's a hundred percent based on somebody I know. What was the biggest challenge writing in separate locations? Time, Time zone. <laughs> Time, Time zone. <laughs> Time zone, yeah. We got a Chicago girl and we had a guy who was literally globe trotting and it was like, where, where, I mean, it was that. And, but again, the credit goes to Anna because you were so organized that you would do the math. I'd be like, I'm in London. What time is, you're like, it, <laughs> It's fine. Three o'clock is 10 o'clock your time. We'll be there. I'll be there. And I was like, okay. And you know, in the beginning when we didn't know each other too well, we just started working out. Like I didn't want to sound like I was tracking your location all the time. So I'd be like trying to find the way, like, where are you now? And what time is it there? But I was trying to find a way to say it in such a way that like, I'm not stalking you. I'm not trying to follow where you're going. Yeah. Um, because it was just interesting to get the times together. A lot of logistics and you did yeah. all that. So thank you for that. How much of your real lives filtered into the book? I found myself relating at least in small part to the burnout Andy was experiencing as the story opened. Did either of you struggle with something like that? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, again, you know, a lot of what Andy went through, I think all of us have gone through in some shape or form. I've gone through it um, and there's this uncanny way of whenever I write something, it comes true. So <laughs> I'll just say that. Yeah. It's like that Paul Dana movie where he, the author like wrote the. Yeah, <laughs> not that, no, no, not in that sense, but you know, I mean, there's just, we've all experienced what Andy has experienced and Warren, like Warren's transformation from being angry at the world 
um, and just not having anything to ground him. There are some times when Chris would say something that he felt and I'd write it down and I'd put it in the book. <laughs> you know, it's funny, my dad and I have a really wonderful relationship and he read the book and loved it. And I was worried that he was gonna think that, you know, I had modeled the dad after my own dad, which isn't true, but there were parts of it. And there was definitely one part where I, a recollection from my childhood is in the book and it turns very dark after the recollection. And I say, everything was amazing before about when, and then when I was five, all of a sudden. And so there's real life memory. And then it um, abruptly within a sentence it goes into fiction. And my mom, after she finished reading it, she was like, is that how you really felt? And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, well, you were describing, and I was, I was describing her doing cartwheels and the sunshine and my dad laughing and blades of grass. And she's like, and then at five, it was just all screaming. I was like, that wasn't you. There was no screaming. What are you talking? She's like, I didn't think there was, but I was, I was like, no, it's fiction. So there was like moments where it was actual, just, yeah, using memories, using real life. And then all of a sudden the freedom, and that's, I think something that I've talked about, the freedom in this kind of writing where you're not bound by a budget because you have to do something or, I mean, we had a hundred percent freedom to just write what we wanted to write, go where we wanted to go. It was really liberating. That brings us to our next question, which you sort of touched on, Chris. Um, have any of your family had a chance to read the book? And if so, can you share any comments they may have said? And you mentioned can your I, dad. Can yes, I and Anna. <laughs> so I was on a Zoom call with Chris two weeks ago and yeah. his parents were there and he calls them to the, to the Zoom call. He's like, mom, dad, you know, this is Anna. And his mom and dad came on the camera. And like, I think to me, Chris, that was my proudest moment for this book. I think your dad comes on and says, I don't read romance, but I read it in like, what did he say? In three days. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was great. And then your mom comes on and says, I couldn't put it down. They loved it. They That's loved wonderful. It. That's really great. Oh and Anne, how about you? Does your family usually read your books uh, as you're writing them? They do. Uh, my husband is reading it right now. They're so used to me writing books, though. It's not like, you know, my husband. Like, oh, she's writing another one. <laughs> yeah. My sisters have read it and they love it. They love it. Um, they just think it's it's so well written. And they say they said the same thing, like, what did he write and what did you write? Because we can't tell. So I think is the biggest compliment for us, for our for yeah. our, because if all of a sudden it just went tonally in one direction and it, it was like a Frankenstein monster, right? Where you just kind of, oh, well, this is obviously where he wrote. And yeah. I love how seamless, and there, there are moments where you interjected, I would write a chapter and all of a sudden there was something interjected and I, and vice versa, where, I mean, it really was this beautiful collaboration of just kind of, and, and we, we do, we both have a very similar voice uh, as far as like the style of writing and it's cool. Chris, this is a question for you. Um, one of your fans would like to know, would you entertain being in the movies for the five books? Yeah, I think that's a plan. I think that's the plan. <laughs> I think you're looking at Warren Yates if I get my way. <laughs> I'm a little old for Warren Yates, but, but I'll still, when we were writing it, Anna, I thought, should we age him up a little bit? Because I was thinking about like, I was like, shouldn't he be a little older if I'm going to play him? But I like the fact that he was kind of young and um, no, I have every intention of, um, I would love to be in, in, in one or two or three of these. And then I also, I think that when we started this process, the goal was, we were thinking television movie. And once we started writing, I remember there was a specific Zoom call and both of us were kind of like giddy. Like we were both like, you know, college kids going like, what if, what if it's more than just, what if it's actually like, what if we just go all the way with this thing? And it really does depend on the readership and it depends on how fervent and excited our audience is. And if you guys love it and you spread the word and you get as many people invested in the story and this world as possible, then places like Warner Brothers or Paramount or Universal are more than willing to open up the pocketbooks and make these movies the way they should be made, which would be with a huge budget and a really big fun cast. And I love that it's multicultural. I like, I love how relevant it is. 
I mean, this is a love story between a girl who's Filipino and a girl and a guy from Hawaii. And each story takes place and goes down different avenues of, of, of socioeconomics. Of, yeah. Like, I love that's what we're writing in book two. We have a whole play on, on what it means to have and to have not and, and what that looks like when you're, you know, falling in love with somebody. Um, and I think they're, I think so, the, so yeah, the, 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 the short answer is, yeah, we're hoping to, to go big with them. This is great. This Q&A is going wonderfully because I think the attendees are mind readers because that brings us to our other question. If you're able to sell the book's movie rights, which I'm sure you will, will it be a movie for each book in the series? Anna, you want to tell them the plan, the, 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 the blueprint right now? I'd love for it to be, yeah. I mean, it would be a series or, or, or um, a movie for each one. I mean, it, it's too big, too cinematic, too beautiful to just limit it to one movie. Yeah. I think, and, and, and the characters have so much substance that you're going to have to, I'm telling Chris, the future producer of the movie, that you're going to have to, yeah. you know, break it out. The goal, the goal is that we would love to make a trilogy with books one, two, and five. And then we have an idea for books three and four, which would be standalone pictures, but that would fit within the universe. So like, I mean, I guess I don't want to compare it to Shades of Grey because it, it's, they're totally different books. And I think if I say Shades of Grey, people are gonna be like, whoa, we can't, we'll lose a portion of our audience um, and probably gain a whole other group. But I digress, um, but like how they did, how they had like a little in like a little universe and they had their trilogy. I would really love for that to be the case for these books where there's a mo like a Kona from Kona with love as a series for people to be just so excited that we can make all three movies. And then really what people want is for movie three and movie four to be made so that we can flesh out the whole thing. That's the goal. And, and I think the just a long answer to this question, but what Chris is trying to do, because we didn't go straight to marketing the right. books for film or anything like that, he wanted um, to see the reception for the book, which, hey. So, you know, the more, the more, the more lists we hit, the more popular the book is, the more, the bigger chance we have of, of making this into a really big movie. Do you have any idea when the second book is going to come out? We do. Next, next, next. Should we? I mean, I'm feeling now I'm feeling a lot of love for March 9th, but in February or March of next year. We're almost done. So guys, don't lose hope. We're, we're almost done. We, there's just a long train you have to follow to release a book. So our publishers, like they need time to promote. They need time for everything else. So that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, we have a we have the audio book recorded already, but it's not gonna be released until about uh, June or July, probably. Yeah, we already had questions at the store about the audio book, so I think uh, people are excited about that as well. Are you both reading it, or he is? You're reading it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. To work on that. I remember reading stuff like, um, like, like. Uh, hold on, I'll tell you what I read. This is like hilarious. Christmas Eve, ready? Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's here. Um, this is the stuff that I had to read, which I thought was just so funny. Oh my gosh. Okay, ready? With that, he kissed me. A kiss so deep and hungry, it made me want everything. The animal desire to bite his lip, allow him to... <laughs> I, I, will, I would continue. Did you giggle through the whole thing? <laughs> read Andy with such a straight face because there's a few little parts where she's, she's imagining this stranger kissing her. And we wanted to create that anticipation and we wanted to create that feeling of desire. And um, there's a point where she's on the beach in a pink bikini and he's like, and all of this, and I have to say something too, because I, um, I've gotten a few notes about, like how, my aunt today, she's like, is this racy? Am I gonna, are we, you know? I was like, it's fine, you're gonna love it. Um, we wanted to create a book that 
was family friendly so that you could, if you love Hallmark movies, you'd be able to read this and not feel embarrassed. Um, but we also wanted to create a sense of, of romance and passion and we wanted it to be sensual. We wanted it to feel like you were falling in love. And so, but all that to say, when I was reading Andy's parts, I was, I was like, oh boy, <laughs> hopefully I can sell it. <laughs> So we have a question about the writing process. You mentioned having the 50K, 60K word goals. Did you have a vague daily word count goal? Um, I started this and I think Chris subconsciously just did it where every chapter would be a thousand or more words. And so when I was sending him a thousand word chapters, who would send me thousand word chapters back? So that's kind of our our thing. It's like it's got to be at least a thousand words when we write a chapter. Because we the way that we're doing it now, and Chris, you can go into more detail. Is right now, especially for the second book, we're doing the chapter tennis thing where I write, he writes another one, and I write again. Because we're we're building on top of each other's chapters. Right. And that was something that you did in your previous novels where you would have these really quick, not quick, but like I read your book and I, I mean, I remember the first book I read of yours, I read it at night because I was able just to push through chapter to chapter and you give me just enough. And I would be like, I got to finish this before I say yes to her. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> I did. I read it that weekend. I was like, I got to know what I'm getting into. I remember we got to a point. It was one of your books. It was, it was your book that was, uh, took place in um was it thailand yeah it's in this life that's what you read and i remember it was the, it was funny because you're right i in our last interview i said around page 15 but it wasn't it was deeper in and they were just about to you know uh come together and, and have a romantic moment and my my spine like i started sweating and i was like oh no because i'd forgotten that there's this whole subgenre of romance novels like the Harlequin, where it's like lit, you know, like naughty lit porn or whatever. And I was like, wait a minute, is that what this is? <laughs> I was like, and then Julianne came down and she's like, what kind of books are these? What are you getting into? You know, you can't. So that's why when I got on a Monday and I was like, I'd be so happy to like, I, I would absolutely want to do this because I'm so relieved when I read the book. Because I was like, well, this I can get behind. Like this we can, we can, we can, we can push forward. Um, but yeah, your chapters were really, they were perfect sized. So I think you've mastered the art of keeping the reader's interest and you go just deep enough and then you wrap up these little nuggets of information, push the story forward and then we start fresh with another chapter. It just makes it easier for us to have that word count back and forth because before you know it, you were at 56,000 words. Yeah. yeah. How long is the book? What, how many words is the book total? Do we know? You know. Yeah, like 77, something like that. Did you learn anything during the process of writing the first book that you implemented into the second, like your writing styles or what worked and what didn't? I mean, it worked last time. Did it all work? It just all worked. <laughs> it was really weird because it worked. It was just really weird. Yeah. Um, our characters who were writing um, are a lot of fun this time. And I think that it's a bit of acting where we're both, Anna and I are both going places. I think Andy and Warren were very similar in, in a way for us to write because it was like, oh, I know these people. We're writing two people that aren't very much like us at all. And so that's different. In book yeah. two. Um, someone wants to know how you came up with the title of the book. Um. You know, it was really hard to come up with a title. I had so many titles in the beginning before Chris even joined. Um, and I think when I decided, huh? Sorry, I was just wondering what some of the other titles were. Do you remember? I, no, I don't remember, but there was a lot. I have it. Oh, no, it's in my other notebook. I can send it to you, but there were so many um, titles. Um, but I think when, when I hit a place where Andy was an you know, worked too hard and worked herself sick. What I wanted was kind of to pull her back and enjoy, slow her life down and enjoy certain moments. And at that time, I didn't know that Chris would still build this world of moments tours in Hawaii. I didn't know that. I just 
felt like it had to be like ap appreciating things at the moment because I do a lot of mindfulness things for my stress and I'm always like you know live in the moment and do all that so I wanted the word moment in there and just came about that was even before we decided they would have special moments yeah well that was the natural I think that was the natural for me as the guy I came in I was like well why don't we give them little moments tour yeah and you were sweet enough to agree to the grand moments tour name <laughs> the idea of that was great yeah. and then it so, just oh no go on go on no I was just gonna say it just unfolded after that like that's it that it really was that simple like it was her because what happened was Anna had written and it, she wrote a chunk of it like the first 20 chapters I want to say or until Warren shows up whichever I mean it's it's a bunch 12 maybe 12 chapters I think well, yeah less than 20 I don't know where you're getting to 20 well I guess it's 12 because I'm looking at it now but you had 12 chapters written when I showed up and which set the template the names all of it the world the universe was basically so my job when I came in was well let's just have these two fall in love and let's have fun and so that collaboration was kind of I mean it was really like we just in our minds we went to Hawaii and we went on this little and 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 it was and I had lived in Hawaii I'd filmed a tv show there called North Shore and um, my son was born in Hawaii so Hawaii and Oahu specifically are very special to me for a myriad of reasons. My parents took me when I was 15 and I got up and sang karaoke. And I'll never forget this. There was a table of Japanese tourists and they all like celebrated my Frank Sinatra song. And it was the first time in my life that I thought I could get up in front of other people and perform. And they invited me to their table and they gave me sake to toast. I was 15. And what they- did you sing? Um, I sang, I did it my way. And they went crazy. They were so like, because they know that song well, yeah. I mean, and they were so pumped. And I was like, whoa, this is what that feels like. So Hawaii was, and then earlier than that, my parents had took me to, so I'd been to Hawaii as a child and then at 15 and then to go and live there and work. And each time it had a really special resonating. So for me, it was just this, it was easy to just jump in and start talking about this place. And my last name, Palaha, everyone's always like, hey, aloha, Palaha. <laughs> So you both, this book obviously came during a year that, you know, uh, the book world and publishing is so different because we don't have in-person book tours right now. So you've been doing a lot of virtual um, book talks. How has that been going for you? The same as this one. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's been going really well for us. You know, um, Chris is always saying that I opened up this world to him and I took him, you know, I took him along with me in this writing world, but he's also taken me on, on my own journey into his world, you know, the just talking about scripts and movies and, you know, the media and, and being in these virtual things, you know, I even ask him what kind of light to buy, you know, <laughs> like, I don't, like he's, he's opened up a whole world to me as well. So I think we're both learning from each other. So we just have a few minutes left, but I don't know if I'm going to put you in the spot, Christopher. Do you have a haiku you'd like to read for us? Well, shoot. <laughs> I'll read, um, this was totally unscripted and unplanned. So if you if you can't find one, but I'm sure you can. No, I can. And I and I think I'm going to read one. Well, it's one of my favorites and it's in the book. It's just a matter of finding it. Um, oh boy. Which, we, it's in every part, right? Yeah, so this is something that I wrote, and it's so funny because I wrote this in 2013. So every, so every once in a while in my life, um, I'll make these weird commitments, you know, like I'll fast for, you know, a certain thing for a certain amount of time. Or, and in 2013, I made a decision to write a haiku a day for social media. Oh. I did it on Facebook and it was one of those wonderful experiences where I went from like having 10 people a day to like 22,000 people a day, like looking at my haikus and being like, you know, inferring how it reflected my life or, and I happened to be on a TV show and it was, the symmetry was good. I did that last year on Twitter. And um, one that I wrote back in 2013 is life is a prison. We are each other's freedom. Do not be afraid. 
and the idea of haiku is five seven five um and and anna was so sweet to say why don't we at every you know part put a haiku in so there's three in this book that you can read um but yeah haiku writing is interesting because it's so you're, you're trying to capture this tiny moment that is fully expressed in five seven five meter i mean it's fun that was that was great and i'm sure we're all going to be uh looking out for more are you still writing your haikus no that was done i'm done with that, that. Done. i moved on to novels well, at least i know now you're on to novels <laughs> Well, thank you both of you for stopping by and sharing more about your wonderful book and a huge thank you to our audience today for joining us. This event will soon be available on the University Bookstore YouTube channel so you can watch it as many times as you want. So have a wonderful day and we hope to see you back at one of our other virtual author events soon. Bye thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Go Seattle.